Hello Penguin Orts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. Today we are finally getting Artemis fully operational and to do that we are launching an Asteria, a crew variant of it. So it's got a much smaller cargo bay, although we are still transporting a small amount of cargo as well. Some quite heavy cargo, in fact, which is why we needed these extra side boosters to actually get it into orbit. So it's looking a bit more like the Falcon Heavy now, rather than the uh, SpaceX Starship, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. It was just sort of uh, almost coincidental uh, that it looked as close as it did. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to have that kind of fully reusable launch system. Uh, and it is still fully reusable as these boosters, uh, as I said. Uh, unlike, you know, previous uh, <laughs> rockets I've been using, like the Albatross 15, aren't solid rocket boosters, and they do have parachutes all over them, so that we can recover them. So, who have we got on board of this magnificent spacecraft? Well, we've hired seven new engineers, because, of course, Artemis is an off-world rocket production facility, first and foremost, and we want to increase our productivity. So, productivity is sort of a stat, um, which is generated from the stupidity level of the engineers that you have on board your base or your space station uh, and certain parts boost their productivity so the workshop modules and stuff tend to boost their productivity by a factor of five uh, so once we get these seven engineers up there with the five engineers that are already on Artemis we'll have 12 engineers and it will come to a productivity of around 58 or so which is pretty good considering the current productivity level is about 15 so it shortens the time it takes to build rockets uh, by quite a significant amount but we also have a number of other crew members so of course we have a pilot to actually, you know, pilot the Asteria, rather important. We also have a biologist, which is very important for farming. If you don't have a biologist, then uh, yeah, your farms aren't going to really produce all that much. Uh, so they produce something like 20% of their maximum yield. So we've got ourselves a biologist who we've hired as well. We also have a farmer who's very important for later on. We don't actually need them right now, uh, but you need a farmer if you're going to use your farms to produce organics, which is a high-end um, material, which we use to produce uh, all sorts of goods down the line. So colony supplies and things we might be producing uh, a little later, probably in the next series at this point. But uh, I don't want to have to change the whole crew uh, over in order to uh, in order to produce those. Uh, so if we add another module later on to make the base fully self-sufficient, then uh, we're going to need a farmer to make that happen. You see here we're uh, trying to reuse these two boosters here, but it's the first flight of this uh, slightly upgraded Asteria, and I didn't quite put enough parachutes on these things. So uh, although the parachutes do deploy successfully, uh, it does not slow them down quite enough. So although one of the boosters survives, the one that's just outside of physics range, uh, the one that we are currently viewing does unfortunately disintegrate. But uh, the center core has been tested beforehand, although it's going a little faster now than it's used to. Uh, so we do put a little bit more fuel for the boost back burn uh, just to slow it down a little bit more so it doesn't burn up on re-entry. And the last two Kerbals we have on board of the Asteria are a Medic. So another Kerbal we don't actually need right now. A medic's only useful if you have a, an actual medical bay, uh, and those uh, essentially reduce the hab timers. I say reduce, they increase the hab timers of the Kerbals. So if the Kerbals are getting homesick, um, then you put them in the med bay and it makes them better again. But it consumes colony supplies, that's not a resource we can currently produce. You need organics, material kits, and specialized parts. So we need another um, module to actually produce organics and then produce the colony supplies from that uh, if we wanted to make it so that our Kerbals could stay up there indefinitely. And finally, we had a little bit of space left. We have enough life support to almost support 18 Kerbals, so I thought, ah, we'll just throw one more on there. So we've thrown a colonist in there. Now, this isn't someone that we hired. We didn't hire the medic either. Uh, these are Kerbals that we rescued on rescue missions way back <laughs> in the beginning of the series and have had no use for them up until our colonization efforts now. But colonists are quite interesting, actually. They don't have any specialized skills whatsoever. So, Beardy, why are you launching one to Artemis? Well, I found out, and I'm finding out a lot of things about USI colonization systems through trial and error. Using the Pioneer and Logistics module on the base, we actually produce funds, science, and reputation just by having the base on the surface of Nemesis. We actually produce that. Um, and having different types of Kerbals boosts the rewards that you get. So having pilots increases reputation, any kind of scientist, uh, so biologists, farmers, and the like, 
all increasing amount of science you get and having engineers or mechanics and technicians that's sort of different variants of engineers uh, that we could get they increase funds colonists however they don't have any specialized um, skills so they can't repair anything or increase productivity or anything like that but they boost funds science and reputation yields all at once so if you have a bunch of colonists then you can actually be producing quite a hefty amount of funds science and the like and I think the amount of rewards you get uh, increases the further you go so we're getting a fair bit um, from our colony on Nemesis once we actually land the, <laughs> the crew there uh, but if we for example made a colony on the wasteland or you know all the way over in another solar system we would get some monumental rewards and that's actually the incentive for building colonies in um, USI, you don't actually necessarily get contracts to build them, but using the resources that you mine and gather, uh, and also the rewards from just having the colony there, that actually provides the incentive for building the colonies, which I think is really quite interesting. It's not very well explained at all. Uh, a lot of the systems of USI are obscenely complicated, and I still don't fully understand all of them, uh, but we are eventually, you know, we are getting there slowly but surely. It also turns out that there are three different sort of um, ratings of a celestial body. You've got the geology rating, the botany rating, I think, and then the um, um, habitability rating of the planet so or you know moon obviously in this case so the more mining you do you gradually increase the geology rating um, from 100% up to I think 500% is the maximum and that gradually increases the yield of your drills the um, botany rating or whatever increases the yield of I think of science labs and stuff uh, and also gets better yields from agriculture and the like and from having agricultural modules and also having uh, colonists and stuff you increase the habitability I think of the uh, of the body that you're on and that very gradually decreases uh, the amount uh, that have timers actually play so if you get the habitability of a body up to 500% then whenever a Kerbal has landed on that body it's actually considered colonized and their hab timer freezes so as long as you've got the supplies to keep them there they can stay there indefinitely and that actually gives us a goal because once we get to a new world once we t go to a new solar system that is the aim I think so I finally got the full-on aim which is for the next series which is going to take quite a long time uh, but we need to get a world to 500% habitability which means having numerous colonies all over and transporting a lot of Kerbals there, a lot of colonists to increase that habitability rating um, and then once it gets to 500% they won't want to go home, that world is considered colonized uh, and I think that is a, a pretty lofty goal but something we can manage um, so that is sort of end goal of well the next series is gonna say this series but no this series is almost at a close uh, but there we go so that's some of the sort of functions of USI explained semi badly by someone who just about understands them but you can see here we finally uh, landed the Asteria at Artemis and we've transferred our crew into the base. And what we're doing now is transferring the rest of our cargo because I found out at the end of the last episode that uh, yeah the productivity of a module is directly tied to the amount of machinery in the module. So machinery is a resource that you use very small amounts of, something like you know one a day um, in order to just keep things ticking over. But what I didn't realize is the productivity of each module is directly tied to how much machinery is in said module. So as you use it, the productivity actually decreases. So I'd saved a bunch of weight on launching the final module just by draining a bunch of the machinery out of all the different modules because we had a bunch stored already and then realized that none of my modules were going to actually produce anything. Thankfully, though, we had a bit of cargo space on the Asteria beneath the crew module. So what we can do is fill the base up with machinery and get everything to its peak efficiency. So now we can also upgrade um, the reputation um, of all, of, I say reputation, the experience of all our different Kerbals. And as you see there, we've got our colony rewards as well. So now we have a bunch of engineers, 12 engineers on the base. We're going to be producing a lot of funds, something like 300,000 funds uh, every 30 days or so, which is certainly not uh, insignificant whatsoever. You can see there the hab timers or so, we can keep them up here for about a year. They're not fully self-sufficient when it comes to supplies, but their supplies will last them two and a half years, so we can resupply them um, every time we recycle the crew, so it's no biggie. 
So, we have a bit of science to play around with because Morningstar has still been researching a bunch of different things. So what we're going to do is go and research the free electron laser and a bunch of the different beamed power technologies. So free electron lasers allow us to beam power across the solar system and essentially means we don't need to have any power generation. So this is integral to our plan. What we're going to do is build some huge solar arrays beam the power using um, soft x-rays because x-rays um, can go much much further they've got much better range you know, the uh, yield you get from them doesn't decrease much with distance which is important when you're going to another star and however um, you don't want to go for hard x-rays because the efficiency is really bad so soft x-rays are a sort of balance and you can see here this is the reason why we needed Artemis <laughs> <laughs> this is Bifrost 1, the first element of our Bifrost array. And you can see this thing is absolutely massive. That is one giant folded up solar collector. It is completely infeasible to launch this kind of thing from Solitude. It's just too big and too fragile. And now we have Artemis fully operational, we can produce these things on the surface of Nemesis and just put them into orbit. And it doesn't even cost us anything, because of course we're producing everything in situ. It takes about 20-30 uh, days or so to produce the necessary amount of material kits and specialised parts to produce one of these things. So we're producing one of these roughly every month or so. And although it is absolutely massive, it only weighs about 15 tons or so. So we only need uh, a small little stage and a bit of fuel, which we're also producing on Artemis, to get it up and into orbit. The reason why I named it the Bifrost Array, I took a little bit of inspiration from the Thor movies and, by extension, Norse mythology. Of course, in that there is the Bifrost, which is sort of a rainbow bridge to the stars. So I thought, well, we're using X-rays, so we're using light to propel us to a, to a distant star, so it's sort of like a, a bridge to the stars. And I thought, yeah, Bifrost, that sort of that sort of suits it. And we've used Greek mythology far too much. I think it's time we borrowed a little bit from Norse mythology. So yes, yeah, this is the Bifrost array, and this is Bifrost one. Now, although once this thing is fully unfurled, it is absolutely colossal. It produces 300 megawatts of thermal power. We lose a lot um, when it comes to the efficiency of the various components because, of course, we have the efficiency of the thermal generator, which reduces it, I think, something like 40%. Um, and then you've got the efficiency of the actual laser itself that we're using to beam the power. And then you've got the efficiency of the receiver. So once something actually receives the X-rays from this array, uh, we end up getting about 10, 20 megawatts or so. Yeah, and uh, we're reducing from 300 megawatts megawatts to about 20 megawatts but the wonderful thing about using solar power apart from you know using a massive nuclear station or something uh, means that we don't need to ever resupply this now this is up in orbit we can just leave it um, and that is wonderful so once we've just got a network of these things up we can just leave them there beaming x-ray power all across the solar system and we don't even you know just have to use this array for our upcoming mission to valentine you know powering our plasma probe all the way to another solar system now we've got this in place we essentially don't need to have huge amounts of power generation on any of our spacecraft we can just stick a small x-ray receiver and and with how good x-rays are at beaming power at extremely long distances, although, as I said, they're not very efficient, you get an efficiency of maybe around 15% on the receiver, whereas if you're using something like infrared, you get much better efficiencies of like 80%, but it reduces very quickly with distance. Um, but because we are using x-rays, soft x-rays as I said, um, we can beam power all over the solar system. So we send future probes um, even all the way out to Reaper or Eltos. You know, we don't just have to use this um, once in order to support this one mission. This is a big piece of infrastructure which uh, we can use in future missions to come. So you can see here we've got yet another Bifrost array, Bifrost 2, and we're launching that. And we can just keep churning these things out. It's really pretty cool. Um, I mean, these are absolutely massive, beautiful arrays. I'm really happy with uh, with how cool these things look. And you can see, just compared to the size of the 2.5 meter parts there, these things are absolutely colossal. Some of you who are more familiar with uh, beamed power might be wondering why I'm using a free electron laser and not the dedicated X-ray laser. Um, but it's just because with the tech we have, 
Um, we've upgraded these basic free electron lasers so they can just about manage soft x-rays um, and because we've got so many upgrades for them with the current tech we have they're actually more efficient than the dedicated x-ray lasers um, so using the free electron laser and just setting it to long soft x-rays uh, is actually a little bit more efficient so we're going to continue uh, building that array in future episodes but uh, we're actually getting quite close to our Drizzen probe arriving at Drizzen soon so uh, before that arrives in the next episode Episode, we're just going to beam back some of the science from Morningstar. If you remember, we kept six of our scientists unfrozen and they're just working their way through a bunch of data from the Demise and Wasteland missions. So we're just beaming back about 6,000 science. We've been doing that over the course of the episode, so now we have a bunch of science to use. So we can get ourselves another upgrade for the free electron laser, increasing its efficiency even more. We can also then grab ourselves another electric engine, the Vasimir engine. I'm going to compare that to the plasma engine. I don't know which is more efficient yet. Uh, we'll have a look. And then get ourselves some exotic fuel storage, which we might need for the Endurance, which will, of course, be launched on episode 50, the finale of this series. But thank you for watching, everyone. I've been the Beta Penguin. I do hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time.